You are listening to Influencers from the Conference Board. Uh, my name is Alex Parkinson. Uh, I'm the co-leader of the Communications Institute at the Conference Board. Delighted to welcome you today to today's uh, August monthly center chat from the Marketing and Communications Center of the Conference Board. Uh, so the, the title of today's session is Building Sustainable Brands, a Packaging and Operations Approach. And I'm delighted to welcome today uh, not only my colleague, JP Coolvine, who I'll hand over to in a minute, uh, but most importantly, no offense, JP, uh, the founder and CEO of TerraCycle, Tom Sackey, who's joining us today. We thank Tom for being with us. That is all from me for now. I will now get to the, uh, the crux of the matter today and hand over to JP and Tom. JP, take it away. Hi everyone, uh, I'm JP Kulvine. Um, you might know me as the leader of the uh, marketing um, or communications institutes, uh, but I've also worked in CPG for now 25 years and have certainly become familiar with the name TerraCycle. Interestingly, uh, in my consultancy, I focus on brand elevation and desirable premium and lifestyle brands. And it's in that context that I really um, started to hear over and over um, things about TerraCycle and about Loop. Uh, and you're gonna see why that might be. Um, you might not necessarily associate brand elevation with waste management or recycling, but we'll see just how desirable this aspect has become to consumers. But without further ado, I wanna introduce Tom, Tom Zaki, he is not only the current CEO of TerraCycle, he's actually the founder, um, uh, co-founder, um, and it all dates back to uh, Princeton University, a cafeteria and some warms, just to create a little bit of interest. Tom, thanks a lot for volunteering to come on the webcast. That's my pleasure. Thanks for having me today. Um, now, uh, I already provided a little bit of a setup. People are gonna ask warms, uh, recycling, can you take us back a little bit before we dive into the current? Like, how did it all start? You were sure. a student in Princeton, is that right? Yeah, and I think uh, for context, I'll maybe even take you a little bit further back. So I'm originally sure. from uh, Budapest. I was born there in 82. And, uh, you know, if, from a European history point of view, it was still communist under the, uh, let's say, Russian uh, rule at the time. And uh, Chernobyl happened in 86, which allowed us to effectively escape, to be honest, as political refugees went to Germany, Holland, uh, and then ended up in Canada. And from there, yes, went to Princeton. And I mentioned that backdrop because um, I really, you know, my, my formative years went from communism to capitalism and that in a very nice sort of progression. And in the process, I fell in love with the idea of entrepreneurship and business simply because I felt like it was the most powerful vehicle to change the world. I think it's more powerful even today than any other vehicle, whether politics or war or disease. And um, when I went to Princeton, I had a real sort of eye-opening moment where I remember this, my first class, uh, Economics 101, the uh, professor asks, what's the purpose of business? And the answer she was looking for was profit to shareholders. And while I think profit is very important, I love capitalism, I felt very underwhelmed by that answer because I think most people interact with a business for the virtue of what it does, what product it makes, what service it provides, and very few benefit uh, or even care about the profit to shareholders. So I had a quest uh, to think about a business idea because I was really interested in entrepreneurship that put purpose first and profit second. Again, not disregarding profit, but uh, putting it in a secondary position uh, to purpose. And um, uh, I sort of really woke up and fell in love uh, with the idea of waste uh, because it's a really interesting topic that is almost entirely disregarded. So first, you know, uh, we make fun of the garbage industry. Even my parents would tell me, if you don't study hard in school, you'll be a garbage man when you grow up, you know, as a joke on motivating me to be a lawyer or a doctor or an executive of some kind. And you delivered Ironic. on that promise. Exactly, exactly right. Um, but we are built, I think, to be repulsed by the idea. We, it's not attractive. It's not something that, you know, a lot of people gravitate towards, which means it's also uninnovative. But yet, it's massive in the sense that every object that you can see today, whether uh, it's our clothing, it's uh, our, uh, you know, the walls of our building, you know, everything, the computer we're speaking on today will one day be property of the garbage industry. So for how big it is, it's wildly uh, uh, uninnovative, relatively speaking. And this was, you know, very interesting to me. And we began uh, uh, by looking at organic waste 
and uh, found that if you fed organic waste to worms, uh, uh, the results, the worm poop, would make a fantastic fertilizer. And uh, TerraCycle began as a business um, with a mission to eliminate the idea of waste. That mission has never changed. But the way we did it was to take organic waste, feed it to worms, package that uh, resulting worm poop in used soda bottles, and then sell it to uh, uh, major retailers in the U.S. like Walmart right. and Home Depot and so on. And that really was our uh, jumping off platform. Uh, right, right. You know, to, and, uh, and, to and I promise we didn't talk about this beforehand, but you laid out already one of the common, let's say, um, principles that we find in premium brands, which is they have a great brand myth, uh, which is a legendary story. You tell the story about coming from the East, about the role of capitalism each time. It's part of the brand myth of, of TerraCycle. And they're very purpose driven. They're mission driven. Uh, yes. We often associate mission nowadays with sustainability and ecology, but missions can go in very many directions, can be social, can be other, think of Ben and Jerry's, etc., or can be just providing beautiful products, can be a mission. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have a very strong brand. Um, let's talk about that. From the early days of fertilizer, that seems kind of cute today almost, and I think it's a side business of yours. The core of your business is all about helping companies recycle, if I headline that. Can you go into how that evolved to this part of the business? Absolutely, and I'll echo it in, uh, I, I do believe storytelling is very important, so I'll answer this uh, uh, to echo your earlier point in, in, in story form, which is, you know, we built the worm poop business to about uh, over three, four years, six million in revenue. I had dropped out of school by then, you know, it was wonderful. And we asked ourselves, is, making our worm poop and used soda bottles, a product made entirely from waste, going to accomplish our mission, which is to eliminate the idea of waste. And we realized, if we make the product the hero, we're going to pick the very best type of garbage to make the product, as you would with any product, and uh, or best type of inputs. And as such, we would never deal with the really difficult waste stream, cigarette butts, dirty di diapers, used chewing gum, all things we do today um, at scale. And so we completely evolved our business. In fact, uh, shut down the worm poop business uh, over a one-year process, of, uh, uh, moved completely away from it to reframe and ask, how do we really uh, reinvent ourselves to solve the mission even uh, uh, more at the core? And the key pivot was shifting away from making the product the hero and shifting it to be making the waste the hero. And that gets us to effectively where we are today. I mean, we're now in 21 countries. You know, we've only grown for uh, every year in our history. And uh, we have a number of business models, but the first one, the one you referenced, the one that TerraCycle as a brand is most known for is ask the question, is that object, could it be a package or a product, could be B2C, B2B, is it recyclable? Can you locally put it in a recycling bin and will it be recycled? If the answer is no, then we set up national platforms to be able to collect and recycle those uh, uh, waste streams. And it's everything from those three things I mentioned, cigarettes, diapers, chewing gum, but hundreds and hundreds of others, from contact lenses to chip bags to pens to oral care products, um, typically in partnership with uh, leading brands and, uh, and retailers uh, who embed this into their ecosystem to increase um, uh, excitement, love, sustainability of their products. And uh, you mentioned uh, the other brands, which is an important aspect of your business. You effectively are a business-to-business -business brand that works with branded goods manufacturer, mainly CPG, the likes of Gillette uh, and, uh, uh, you know, across Unilever, uh, uh, Procter & Gamble, you name it, all the big uh, packaged goods manufacturers. Um, how does that work? What do they own? Which part of the equity and the process and the capital? And what do you own in this process? Great question. Yes. Yeah. So the um, first important is to take a step back. And you'll notice I'll say this in every one of the business models we describe is to understand the reason for the issue. So the reason something is not recyclable today, it's not because it can't be. It's because it costs more to collect and process than the results are worth. Inversely, what makes something recyclable is if it's profitable for a garbage company to go collect and recycle it. Um, so aluminum cans we wouldn't touch because the aluminum is valuable enough to motivate recyclers to set up recycling platforms for aluminum cans. However, uh, something like a juice pouch in the beverage industry would be a good example where it is more uh, expensive to collect and process than the results are worth. So the simple solve is you need to find the economic difference. And we find the best place to go 
is brands and retailers, simply because consumers project the responsibility to those stakeholders. While there are others involved in the supply chain, you know, the packaging converters, the oil companies, the Dow DuPonts, consumers really point the finger at the brands and the retailers for whatever reason. And uh, so what we say to a brand, you know, let's say someone like Colgate, uh, for, uh, where their toothbrushes and toothpaste tubes today are uh, not nationally recyclable, that if you fund the actual economics of collecting it and processing it, minus the recovered value, we can make your toothbrushes and toothpaste tubes nationally recyclable. So to, to go into the detail you asked about, um, this is typically owned, this particular business unit, by uh, brand managers, you know, marketing, that type of uh, uh, area of the business in the B2C uh, biz, uh, products. In B2B, it may be more operationally owned. Um, and they pay the bill every time we receive waste of the cost of collection and processing minus the value. And we do absolutely everything else. Uh, we run the entire supply chain. Uh, we recruit collectors. We encourage them, incentivize them to keep collecting uh, and recycling. But we also, and this is very important, any sustainability endeavor you're going to embed into a brand, we don't just do this because it's the right thing to do. It is. It is very sustainable. But to create longevity in a program, uh, which what I mean is that the program survives when the stakeholder rotates onto a new job, and to create scale, uh, which I define as, you know, uh, a Gillette not just launching in the U.S., but then expanding all over the world, which they uh, have recently done, um, we need it to create short-term traditional ROI. And uh, we do that primarily by helping the brands leverage the program with their key retail partners to drive incremental sales, displays, and so on. Because the big lesson we've learned in uh, at least CPG-type marketing is what makes the world go around is incremental gondola ends, incremental displays. And if you get those, it's very easy to define uh, the ROI of the program. So we do right. uh, try to make that happen. Right. And in addition... Uh, I guess, to the uh, trade support, which might still be kind of temporary, you have a seal and you have kind of ongoing communication that the brands yes. can use. And obviously, the subject of sustainability is very much top of mind to a lot of particular leading edge and influential consumers. Yes, absolutely. So we really focus on a 360 approach where the brand funds, um, you know, does their approvals. And it's super, it's everything. It's from your social media, digital. We help them how to leverage on their website. They print their logo on, uh, or our logo on their package to show that it's recyclable. They put, uh, you know, we do big publicity campaigns. We leverage a trade. We do everything to make it as overall holistic uh, as possible. Right. And then we manage the actual collector. So if you are, let's say, recycling for Pampers and call the customer service line, you'll speak to someone on our end helping you uh, uh, succeed in uh, in doing so. And the more turnkey, the better, because the recyclability of the package is not the core business of these companies. Um, and so they want it to be as plug and play as humanly possible. Right. Now, um, when I look through the commentary and the press coverage, etc., I mean, the vast majority of it is very positive, particularly in today's context. But there are also some challenges. One thing that um, I commonly read is, um, you know, are the manufacturers or are you helping the manufacturers kind of absolve themselves from a responsibility of making products that are less wasteful because, you know, let's say you have a program uh, with a Gillette or with a battery manufacturer or with a lace chip. Um, in effect, you're only going to collect a very small fraction of these handles or these bags. And even at that, it seems like you need to accumulate first. So at first, it is huge mountains of unrecycled material that uh, kind of accumulates in New Jersey at your headquarters. What's your perspective on that? Sure. And I think there's a, there's three different topics here. So I'll break them each out um, just to go backward. It's easier for my memory. So uh, the first is, yes, we do have to gain critical mass of waste streams to process. Now, in, we're in 21 countries, each have their own warehouses. The U.S. has four. So if you collect in California, it's not going to come out to New Jersey. It'll come to our West Coast warehouse. And uh, as the volume gets bigger, which is the second point, um, we uh, process more frequently. So in a waste stream, you know, uh, like a Gillette, it probably will take a year before we make our first processing run. But then in some waste streams, like, for example, we manage uh, an espresso's program in, in a number of countries or Dolce Gusso's or coffee capsules, there we process every day. 
And uh, while every program starts small by definition, uh, some of the programs that are more mature uh, can get up to 10, 15% of the entire category of that country. So um, uh, it does get bigger, but 15%, which I would view as a big success uh, on a national level on a waste stream, and that's filling up you know, truckloads a day type of volume, is still leaving 85% not recycled, to be very fair to your point. Um, uh, uh, now, it could, the first point you mentioned is, does that absolve the brand? Does that say, well, I can stop? And here's what I would tell you. And we tell this to our brand partners all the time, and I'll say it here publicly, noting this you know, video is, you know, will be shared out uh, to the world, is that it's better for everyone to design into recyclability. If you just care about economics and you couldn't care about the environment, it's much cheaper to design your package to be locally recyclable than to pay a TerraCycle to collect your currently non-recyclable waste and make it recyclable. So the motivations are always aligned with design into recyclability. Now, why don't they do that then becomes the key question, right? And the reason they don't is in some cases it may not be technically possible today. To make a toothbrush, it just take that as an example since we had mentioned it, uh, there is no design of a toothbrush today, it doesn't exist, any toothbrush ever, that is locally recyclable. Um, it just doesn't, uh, the, the recycling systems don't have that capability. Um, right. And in fact, today, unfortunately, and this is a big disaster, recycling is trending downward. Uh, recy the recycling industry is crashing uh, for all intents and purposes. And it's doing so for three reasons. One is uh, oil is cheap, which is what the recycling output is hedged against. Also, end markets like China, but now other markets, uh, Indonesia and others, have stopped the importation of that material, which has cut the demand markets by half. Um, so a good example is today, if you have clear PET bottle, like a soda bottle, it will be recycled in a local recycling center. But if you have green PET bottles, in many cases, it will not be because the green uh, is, uh, there's no market uh, strong enough to take the green plastic. Uh, which is why, for example, Coca-Cola, in uh, one of its equities, one of its beverage equities that was in green packaging, has moved over to clear uh, to be able to solve for that. And that is the right answer, design into local recyclability. Um, and then the third reason that recycling is hurting right now is because the, the quality of the packaging, from a recycler's point of view, is decreasing. Uh, packaging right. is becoming thinner and more complicated. Complexity means you have to spend more money to acquire a sellable material, and thinness and lightweighting means that you get less because you're mining waste for value. You'd spend more mining it and get less out. So um, right. that macro sort of challenge is profound, uh, and I always say that these platforms are solutions up until these these waste streams can be locally recycled. I mean, it's a it's a terribly complex subject. I mean, now with actually recycling or so-called recycling coming back from developing markets that no longer want to take our trash because it's too mixed up and it's not easily recyclable, it will become even more of a headache, I guess, for communities and and locals. The, the question I also have is, you know, you, you started with the fertilizer and the warm poop. You've gone, um, I think the cigarette butts were very, um, uh, very much uh, uh, talked about. I don't know if you still do that. Um, you, you, you've done Gillette, you've done Lays. How, with, with this being such a vast area, how do you decide where to engage, when to engage, and also what to drop? Um, are you at risk of like overstretching yourself? It's a good question. So, um, so first to answer your question on cigarettes, yes, we still do the uh, cigarette recycling program in 11 countries around the world, and it's only growing, which is fantastic to see. Hundreds of millions of cigarettes coming in every month uh, to be recycled in uh, US, uh, North America, Western Europe, even Asia, like Japan and so on. Does the cigarette so uh, industry participate in that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. In uh, every country in the world, the national free recycling programs are funded by uh, uh, big tobacco companies. Okay. Um, now, in some cases, just as an asterisk on cigarettes, in some cases, the collection partners, the locations collecting, may not wish to use a program that's funded by big tobacco. 
So there's also the option to fund directly. So if you're a city, for example, and you'd like to have citywide cigarette recycling, you could use the free program funded by a, uh, you know, BAT or uh, uh, JT. These are tobacco companies. But if you if you don't feel comfortable with that, you can pay directly for the uh, for the service. And some elect to do that to not be associated with uh, that type of funding uh, uh, right. measure. So yes, these typically grow. Now, to answer your question, I'm, you know, we're open to working with anyone who's interested, and we've created a protocol that allows us to take almost anything, um, which seems incredibly complicated, and to do that in a way that is simple and manageable. And that is to say that, yes, every waste stream is wildly different. How you would collect, say, I just have objects on my desk here, a stapler and recycle it is very different than how you collect a cup and recycle it. But there's a similarity. It has to go through three questions. It has to go through how do you collect it, which is what is the device, what is the transportation, and so on. Then it has to go through how do you process it, uh, how do you take it apart, get the materials out. And then third, you have to ask how do you uh, fund it uh, and generate enough value to have someone want to pay to collect and recycle these things. And that's how we build our uh, team uh, uh, and our organization around those questions. So those then end up becoming similar and manageable and allow us to take a very wide range of waste and to continue uh, to grow. We, um, you know, I would say uh, typically for every 10 programs we launch, we may close half a program or something like that. Um, so say for every 20, we may close one. And that's usually tied to the funding being available. You know, maybe the priorities of the company change, maybe they uh, design their product differently or whatever it may be, but these tend to just keep growing and stacking at this point. And, and internally, organizationally, I understand you also break it down between yourself and partners. I think you work with Suez, for example, in yes. Europe, if I, I get this right. Um, how is that split between kind of developing the process and executing the process? Absolutely. It's a good question. So, yes, uh, Suez uh, isn't just partner. They own 30% of TerraCycle and UK, France, Benelux, and Nordics. Similarly, Waste Connections in Canada, largest garbage company in Canada, owns 25% of our Canadian business. And there's many, many other such examples around the world, from Japan to Brazil and so on. Now, what we do is all of our staff, we're about 350 uh, staff members, are office-based staff members. And our entire supply chain, all the physicality of what we do, which is actually quite big and growing is all third-party vendors like Suez. Because what we found is that today there's so much infrastructure out there and capability for infrastructure, we don't need to create it ourselves and have the headache of managing it. So take cigarettes, just because we had mentioned it, we at TerraCycle will invent, our scientists will, and just above me is a whole floor of laboratories, will invent the process to how to recycle cigarettes, but then we'll work with a Suez who will actually deploy the process and run it uh, for us, uh, sort of like a, um, a co-manufacturer or a packaging company would for a, a packaged product good uh, uh, manufacturing process. And so uh, that is uh, one of the reasons we're really excited about working with large infrastructure companies is because we need those companies to be excited and interested in deploying uh, uh, our uh, SOPs to be able to create these recycling solutions. Gotcha. And um, while we're at organization, um, I think you have several dynamics going on, even within the TerraCycle employee and volunteer organizations, which is there is this aspect of, act, uh, 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 of activism, of energizing people. You have volunteers, yes. for example, participating in collection programs in communities. I think you have volunteers during the summer at TerraCycle itself and so on and so on. And then you have a professional organization. These are employees. These are people who need career plans, etc. How do you handle that as an organization? And how do you handle it you or yourself? I guess you must have grown into different roles over time. Can you describe that a bit? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And it goes to the power of purpose that you had mentioned earlier. So, you know, we have, I would say... Uh, the most important community, without them we wouldn't exist, are the collectors. And I'm proud to say there's over 200 million people around the world who collect waste through a TerraCycle program somewhere in the uh, countries where we operate. So those folks are motivated by one thing, which is help save the environment. And luckily, with the uh, 
you know, where we are in the world today, that is growing. And that's uh, fueled really by forces bigger than myself, you know, by the media, by the general uh, discussion, by politicians. You know, the fact that there is waste being written about every day uh, as a crisis, laws being passed and so on, that fuels that it's a topic of interest. And so that's critical because without that, none of this would exist. Then from there, now the way we motivate them is uh, through um, making these systems easy because many of them just want these systems to exist and will participate. They've been seeking them and there hasn't been an option. Then we supplementary motivate by incentives, typically, by the way, incentives that don't benefit them personally, but benefit their community, like playgrounds for schools in need or inner city gardens or donations to charities. We've given away just under $50 million in these forms of donations. So usually not direct payment to the volunteers, but hey, by volunteering and collecting, you get some money for every piece of waste you uh, collect and you can give that to a school or charity of your choice. That's how that 50 million has come together. Then the next level down from that, are, um, I'd actually say our partners, you know, the, uh, the people, you know, at companies who fund us, uh, whether it's consumer product companies, retailers, uh, manufacturers, and their purpose is very important because people in these companies want to do the right thing. They want to be able to uh, feel good about, you know, their role and what they've done with their lives. And uh, the easiest way for us to do that is to, is to help them uh, see how doing that will uh, fulfill their business goals. And so their purpose is critically important. And I also say, Purpose opens doors that you would never be able to open before. You know, the amount of interaction we have with CEOs of global companies um, is disproportionately high compared to our revenue. You know, I've many times had companies who are in billions of revenue tell us that we have more access to senior leaders than they do. And this is not right. just once or twice, but a lot. And it's purpose that separates us. Um, right. And people want this and it's really tremendously valuable. Right, right. And this is actually uh, interestingly where I said in my discussions with students at NYU, when we were talking about premium brands, uh, we often talk about uh, what we call the disciples. You know, those are the people who are the big fans of the brands who will carry the word of mouth, who will buy the latest products, who will blog about it, vlog about it, write about it. They can be of different types, but many of these brands have that in common. They also have... Uh, then obviously uh, their get-togethers, their reunions, they celebrate um, and they live through, you know, th their efforts being mirrored in the press, just like you describe it. So in that sense, you are similar to a Gucci or, uh, you know, a fashion brand or a, a modern hip lifestyle brand like Allbirds or, or whatever it might be. Um, I want to get back, though, to also the professional organization. Yeah. So you have this world, which which is kind of glamorous in a way, interestingly. Um, how do you manage the day-to-day -day grind of, you know, managing your engineers and, you know, making yeah. everyone happy there? Was that difficult? Yeah, so uh, uh, it's very interesting because if you think about it, I mean, now we're mature. We've been profitable for many years. We're at scale, so we can compensate people, you know, in the objective compensation like cash and benefits and health care in a way that is competitive with an average organization. Now, earlier in our history, we couldn't, so we disproportionately had purpose as a compensation, feel good about what you're doing, and disproportionate objective compensation. That purpose is maintained, but the objective compensation has become, I would say, at market rate. Um, uh, so we pay people basically what they should be paid for those roles, and about the same as what they'd be paid for those roles in other uh, uh, organizations. But, and this is the cool part, because of purpose, we get really fantastic talent. You know, I'm the, the team and the quality is very high. And I'd say what's been interesting, actually, in the past two years, garbage. So for I've been doing this for a little bit over 15 years. And in that whole time, garbage has always been a problem. No one's ever said it's a good thing. But in the past two years, it's gone to a crisis. And what has happened has been so interesting is we're now flooded. I mean, flooded, probably 10x increase in inbound inquiries of people who want to work with us. And the most common example is people who uh, took uh, have long-standing careers, 25 years or whatever, at consumer product companies and retailers saying, I don't want to, you know, die thinking all I did was make candy, you know, or all yep. I did was make, uh, you know, shampoo. I want to take all those amazing skills I have and deploy it and feel really good about what I'm doing. But in an industry, I, all, I still understand, you know, and that's uh, uh, been amazing. So the purpose, now that our comp compensation is competitive, 
really brings to us a phenomenal amount of inbound talent in trust. Um, and, and, and also to go one step further, people, I think, care more, you know, uh, and that means uh, higher quality work, more work, um, if you look at it in objective employer uh, uh, perspectives. Right. I want to move from HR to PR uh, because it, it, it seems to fit here, which is you say purpose stayed at that high level and um, you're able to, to have other meaningful compensation to add to it. People kind of stream to that purpose. You personally, um, if I said there were the disciples or there are there are there is this important group of disciples, we call them the Uber target, you would be kind of the prophet. And when we sure. look at you, uh, and this is very consistent across your pictures, I'm not um, uh, fetching too far here in yeah. looking like a prophet. Can you tell to, you. Uh, can you tell us from a PR perspective, I would think, there is some thinking and some planning behind that, and there is some management behind that. Do you manage how you appear, what you say, where you say it, where you appear? Personally, do you by now have a team that approaches this strategically, or does it all happen intuitively? It's a good question. So I would say two aspects here. Uh, one is the media strategy itself, and, to, uh, uh, and the other is sort of the persona of Tom, you know, my, uh, uh, there. I would say, and I'm joking, you know what's coming to my mind now is, uh, I'm sure you've, everyone's seen, you know, the Theranos uh, uh, documentaries, you know, where Elizabeth Holmes, their CEO, you know, raised a lot of money, ended up, you know, uh, having some criminal activity. And that's not what I'm leaning towards here, but she created a, uh, a personality uh, style, uh, most uh, uh, articulated by like the lower voice, uh, which was a really interesting thing. She spoke at a lower voice than her natural voice uh, to command more respect. That is very difficult to manage uh, if you are sort of faking it um, or doing something that isn't you. So I'd say the personality, what I have done is tried to create or tried to live, you know, the most comfortable existence, you know, that I that I have. I believe in this very deeply, so it comes incredibly easily. You know, the, the simple example of why I'm always in a T-shirt and jeans is that's way more comfortable than putting on a suit and tie. Uh, uh, it's not a stretch, you know, uh, same with, you know, not shaving often or, or having longer hair. This is all just, but frankly. But let's, let's say it also helps stand out in pictures about Davos oh, where you totally. appear like this next to uh, tied up CEOs of the biggest companies in the world all wanting to talk to you. Yeah, so this is the funny part, right? I did it to be completely fair in out of comfort and out of saying, look, I am going to be who I am and let my work stand on its own, not the way I dress. And it became something people really loved. I now, I've there's been moments where I've put on more formal attire and the people in the suits criticize me and be like, what the hell, why are you showing up like this? Yeah, like, you know, so it actually plays brilliantly. You know, I'm, I'm able to travel in a little backpack everywhere I go and I'm, you know, in over a hundred countries a year. So it, it, it's, 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 what I would say is in that idea of managing persona, sure, you know, uh, there is a persona, but it's much easier to make that a persona that is a downhill, like it's easy, than an uphill one where you have to work and manage towards, because then you'll slip and it will be challenging. And it's also an authenticity uh, uh, piece. You know, we try to be very transparent um, in every way, uh, uh, because I think that's very important to folks. You know, um, we had, uh, you know, we, I invite people over to my home all the time, uh, 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 you know, so that it's, it's everything is out there and it's not like I have some alternative lifestyle in the background. Um, now, on the other side, um, how we do this professionally, like the media itself, and that highlight to you sort of the results. I mean, today, TerraCycle is featured in over 40 articles every day, without exception uh, uh, this year. That will be our average. Um, you know, when we launched Loop, within uh, 30 days, and Loop is a very common word, uh, if you Google it, you get over a billion results. We are now number one uh, 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 on those results after th you know after 30 days of launch without pen spending a dollar on it. So we we really know how to do this, and what we try to do in publicity, and I think this is very important. In fact, it'll be the uh, fifth book I write is uh, a, t a book that will be called Negative Cost Marketing, and the thesis is why pay to be the advertising when you can get paid to be the content. And right. this starts with really good publicity. Without that, it doesn't happen. And so we focus on helping the journalists do their job, not trying to get our message out there. So journalists are looking for trend topics. They're looking to make it easy to get interviews. They're looking to make it easy to have you know, good photos and to do it authentically. And so when we approach the media, we do it in, uh, in a way that's how do we help the journalists do their own job versus here's a press release and priests write about us.
And that is a material difference that increases our rate of getting articles uh, uh, in a huge way and the length and quality and just positivity of the articles is significantly higher. So if you're a journalist, we'll call you and be like, hey, we see that you're interested in these types of topics. Here's some interesting trend topics that you may want to talk about. Hey, we'll help you line up whatever interviews you want, get the photos. And by the way, here's how TerraCycle participates in those macro uh, right. uh, trends. We right. also then really lean on how do we get our partners to do the work for us? You know, uh, how do we convince our, uh, our partners to put our logo on their package, which is now on over, I believe, 100 billion packages per year? How do we get them to integrate us into advertising and so on by showing them how it will benefit them uh, to do so? And I think that's the really sort of the trick of negative cost marketing. We even had our own TV show for four seasons that did that. Right. Uh, just for perspective for our uh, listeners and our audiences, how many people would work at TerraCycle in the kind of communications area? And, and, and how does that relate to, like, what's your current uh, 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 turnover? Uh, I, I mean, in terms of uh, uh, business numbers. Oh, sure, sure. So here's, uh, so this year we'll do uh, just under 45 million in revenue. Uh, that's our uh, turnover. Uh, uh, and we're, you know, having good, uh, good overall growth. Um, employees, you know, uh, right now I think we have 320 plus about 30 open roles, so call it 350. And of that 350, I'm just guessing, but I'd say maybe 10% is dedicated to uh, what you what we would call communications uh, type work. So everything from digital, social to uh, traditional, uh, engaging communication type uh, work. And what's your perspective on the importance of traditional media? You talk journalists, for example versus the social media, whether it appears on digital, on the web or not, but the traditional journalists versus the bloggers and the social media, do, do you have a perspective, one is more important than the other, is there a split in your mind? Oh, um, good question. Um, volume is all that matters. The number of people who read, it doesn't matter if it's a radio show or a TV show or a magazine or a movie or a you know Instagram post, to me that's all vehicles. All that matters is distribution. So the bigger the number, the more the followers or the more the circulation, the better. That's key, but the other is the quality of it. You know, uh, we should never disregard quality. Um, uh, so both of those together are the critical aspect. I would always, um, uh, you know, my joke in uh, uh, this idea of negative cost marketing is, you know, ad agencies, advertising agencies are not set up to get you pressed. They're set up to get your retainer, right? And the way you can know that is that ask, next time you hire an ad agency, tell them, look, instead of paying you a retainer, I'll pay you on an algorithm on the press you achieve, multiplying circulation by quality by a numerical factor, and none of them right. will agree to that. This is the funny part. When we uh, are sometimes hired for press, we'll always do that algorithm because we can get mountains of publicity that are high quality by, uh, you know, but especially, here's the key, I couldn't do it for topics that wouldn't have purpose. Purpose is the right. driver. Right. So we come back to kind of the peak of the pyramid when it comes to brand building. Um, we're running out of the time for the interview, and I want to make sure we leave enough time for questions. But so I want to ask you three quick ones to answer uh, just because uh, 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 there are quotes from you and they are an area that you want to talk about. First one is you talk in the context of PR and talking about TerraCycle about the steak and the sizzle. Uh, if you remember that, can you just in one, two sentences tell us what is that all about? Sure. Especially so in the context of PR, you know, many times companies think what matters is how many employees they have, what their revenue is, how much volume they do. And no one cares. Everyone cares about how did that product or service affect a human being? And that is so critically important to focus on, not the weight of an object, uh, which I would call the steak and the uh, how it affects the human being, you know, the sizzle. But it's also why, you know, you mentioned cigarettes a few times, right? We really love going after the extreme, the taboo, the things no one ever thought of, dirty tampons, dirty diapers, dirty chewing gum, dirty cigarette butts. Why? You know, we mentioned those is because those tweak these sort of sizzle points in, in the brain and they people just go crazy for it. Inversely, if I said dirty pens, dirty mascara brushes, dirty chip bags, the, that would go down a bit and right. it wouldn't be as exciting. So it's so right. important. Those things, because then if you can do cigarettes, you can do anything, you know. And except, 
except when you wear the lay the 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 jacket made of lays um bags which is part of the sizzle i guess it, it is it is and this is where you know we deploy upcycling a lot like behind me you see a logo that's made from wine corks that would be called upcycling the majority of what we do with wine corks is shred them and make them into a material that may go into uh, uh shoes and uh sandals and so on but you need the sizzle which is this multiplied by the stake, which is where all the volume goes. And those may not be the same thing. And especially in the world of recycling, which is very industrial, all people know about is steak, and they have completely lost the idea of sizzle and right. even sometimes make fun of it. Yet, you know, I always tell uh, garbage companies this. Think about how much Procter & Gamble spends on waste services and add three, four zeros, and then you've gotten to their marketing budget. Right, right. And uh, uh, for for my for my students, you know, uh, sizzle we call provocation, and it's a very common device for lifestyle and luxury brands. So again, I want to draw the parallel here between waste and luxury, just for the fun of it. Another quote that I had from you from a previous conversation was, "You love the one-upmanship and the competition you cause between CPG CEOs." Can you explain that in a few words? Yeah, to, especially in Loop, which is a uh, platform we launched uh, this year around durable, reusable packaging, which is elevating design to whole new levels. And I think combines the perfect storm of that sort of luxury uh, excitement with profound sustainability. Usually those are inverted. You know, usually sustainability means a crappier experience for all intensive purposes, you know. But this is about elevating both. And to me, that's sort of a silver bullet opportunity in, 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 in sort of changing the landscape. And what's really exciting about it is I've, I've seen this play out over and over uh, that, um, that, you know, one brand or one company sees what uh, an innovation occurred, you know, let's say in mouthwash, you know, Crest, uh, which is P&G, released the mouthwash in Loop, and then Colgate saw it and then immediately wanted to create a better version. And this sort of bounce back and forth to me is the beauty and the magic of what competition is all about and why the consumer wins from competition. The, it, it's not the, the sort of monopolistic, nasty type of competition where the consumer loses and uh, gets worse service for more money. This is the exact, the beauty of what, you know, sort of, I think Adam Smith would have loved to see in the concept of what competition does. So it harks back to almost the beginning, your Princeton economy uh, uh, sure. e uh, class, economics class. Uh, the good of, of capitalism. And the final question was actually what you already talked about. Now, loop, loop, loop. Everyone's talking about loop. If you just give us the one sentence version, what is it? How is it different? Sure. So loop is simply, well, the one sentence would be, it's the rebirth, the reboot of the milkman in an incredibly modern way. Um, uh, maybe a, a, a bit more detail is that it's an engine for brands. Uh, today, actually, almost every major brand in the world or every major conglomerate in the world is working with us to reinvent their products into durable, uh, refillable, functional packaging from ice cream to laundry detergent, shampoo to orange juice. Um, and it's also an engine for retailers like uh, Kroger or Tesco or Carrefour, Loblaws, to integrate this into their ecosystem. And the simplification is you get a disposable experience, but act reusable while wildly upgrading your lifestyle and uh, your interaction with products that you already know and love. Right, right. Um, with that, I want to open it up, actually, to make sure we, um, we get questions. And I want to remind people, because I see they're making a mistake here, to ask the question in the Q&A function, not in the chat function, but it's okay. We captured those. Um, but if you have further questions, ask in Q&A so that Tom can see it as well. Let me ask one question we got here, which is um, on loop, uh, actually, which is uh, these materials, so the, the bottles come back. Do they get distributed then to each of the manufacturers to be washed and refilled, or is that done in a central place? And if it's not done in a central place, how does that work out to be favorable in terms of CO2 and transporting empty bottles and so on? Good question. So the direct answer is that the loop packaging, let's say you would buy it at a physical retailer or online. Today it's available online next year in physical stores. Let's say just for sake of conversation, you buy an ice cream, uh, a laundry detergent, and an orange juice, just because those are three different manufacturers. You would buy them together, you would use them together, and then you'd return them you know, uh, uh, as, you, uh, as they are empty to one point. Then altogether, those are sent to a loop distribution center where they are 
checked in, so you get your deposits back, sorted, you know, the, or the ice cream from the orange juice from the laundry detergent is sorted out. Then we store enough till we get to critical mass. Then in 99% of the cases, we clean it. In 1% of the cases, the brands clean it. And then from there, yes, it goes to each of the brand's manufacturing locations, which are in different locations. So which begs the question that was asked, how is this at all favorable from a life cycle analysis or LCA point of view? And we've done quite a number of robust LCAs, and this is what's important to, to think about. In reuse, people always ask the question of uh, transportation very accurately because there is a little bit more transportation involved, but just a little bit. Remember, in disposable packaging, you still have very heavy trucks taking disposable waste to a landfill or to a recycling center. And in recycling, there's actually more transportation than in reuse because you have to go to recycling centers, recycle, split the material, send those to dis uh, in, uh, different manufacturing facilities from those to filling facilities. And when you look at the entire LCA, including the cost of making new uh, packaging, uh, a reusable package will be more environmentally expensive on its first use. By its second or third use will be equal, and by the fifth to 10 use, depending on the package, will be uh, about 50 to 75% better uh, than uh, disposable packaging and just keeps getting better till about a finite 90% better than disposable. Uh, after that, it's uh, it doesn't really get much better than that. And that's looking at all the various uh, uh, factors, including uh, all of the transportation uh, uh, that's involved. And do note that, you know, when we transport, say, the empty haagen containers back to Nestle, um, they go in full truckload, uh, you know, typically in the most efficient possible transportation method. And again, the number one impact on the environment is not transport, it's the extraction of materials. That is disproportionately more impact than moving things around. Right. And I guess you you depend very much on scale here again. This can only work if you have the scale to make all these uh, yeah. cleaning facilities and all that transportation efficient. Is that right? That's right. And it's why we focused on the biggest and FMCG category. FMCG is the biggest volume of our consumption. And that's why our first okay. partners were... And P&G, Unilever, Nestle, Mars, Pepsi, those sort of companies. And, and how are the subscriptions going so far? Yeah, really well. Um, you know, the sign-up rates are great. People are ordering, reordering, all those things that you would love to see in traditional business. But maybe I'll share the unintuitive learnings. because Those are, you know, perhaps more, more interesting, which is one of the unintuitive learnings we've seen is that people are price sensitive to the cost of the content. They'd like it to be the same. The orange, you know, Tropicana in durable, they'd like to see sell at the same price as Tropicana in disposable, for sure. With that said, they are not sensitive to the price of the deposit, which is actually really interesting. Uh, people are also very excited about the design uh, uh, and are gravitating to the platform both for design and for uh, uh, sustainability. So those are very sort of interesting learnings that will help uh, uh, as we do new package development. And when we when we go back to the Uber target, and I get to your question in a second, Linda, it's noted. Um, when we go back to the Uber target, the people who are the early adopters, the apostles, do you see this in loop? Are there people, I could imagine that people who are into lifestyle and design like the idea that they have these beautiful aluminum bottles or, 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 or cans or whatever it might be. Do you see that, that there is an early adopter group like that? Oh, sure. And not just a little, but at a crazy level. Uh, and there's two uh -huh. reasons because it, 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 it does two things. And, you know, this is manifested by people are posting all the time on Instagram on when their loot box shows up, just the box, and that they're so excited to open it. We get a lot of videos of, like, the opening, finally loop is here. And why? So it's the Instagrammable moment. Oh. It's the oh, yeah. unpacking. Oh, yeah. It's um, yeah. social yeah. media worthy. Very much so. Um, and it, it, it's because of two things. It's profoundly more sustainable, and people are looking for that, but it's also an elevation of their lifestyle. And those two combinations really touch at the, the two very high motivating factors. And if you can get them together, my goodness, you, it's, it's, it's like a, it's like a perfect storm. And it's, it's, that is why we are, you know, seeing the type of love, uh, uh, for the platform. And love is very important right now because this is such a profoundly new platform. There are learnings. There's changes. There's, you know, uh, and, and learning is a fancy way to say there was a problem we solved, right? That's sort of just a nicer way to say learning. Right. And so people, uh, the love helps go through, get through that because people are, you know, excited about the cause, not just about the particular interaction they have with that example. You know, right, and right. this is critically important for the success of something that's going to be changing uh, uh, the assumption so much. OK, Linda, thanks for using the Q&A function, actually. And Elian will get to your question as well, even though you use the chat function. 
Now, Linda's asking something that brings us into a totally different direction, but still obviously on recycling. She says, have you ever been approached by agricultural chemical manufacturing companies about uh, recycling their pesticide containers, I guess, which also has a contamination issue on top of it to it? Yes. Yeah, so, so the direct answer to the question uh, is yes, uh, we have. In Brazil, actually, uh, we're putting a platform together. It's launching soon around pesticide uh, containers, I believe. Um, the greater answer to the question is we do do regulated containers. Uh, uh, we have a whole TerraCycle regulated waste division that focuses on things like pharmaceuticals, uh, aerosols, flammables like nail polish or perfume, you know, and, and many other things. And it, what's interesting is we spoke today only about B2C because that's what, you know, is sort of consumer facing. Literally half of our business is B2B. And there's a lot of regulation involved uh, in, in doing that. Um, uh, your question also asked, I think, you know, on Asian countries, and uh, we do operate today in China, Korea, Japan, Australia, uh, New Zealand, um, uh, and we do have that type of platforming uh, uh, there as well. Right. Excellent. Elian is asking, he says, aren't there other forms that are much more environmentally uh, uh, friendly than recycling, which is, for example, um, trying to avoid packaging altogether? or using uh, compacted and concentrated products and diluting them at home in containers you already have. And how do you think about those? Don't they destroy your business? Sure, um, a, very ac a very good question. So uh, what I would say is that, you know, with the crisis we're in on waste, we need to have multiple answers and we provide some and not all others. And, you know, and, and even internally, uh, some of our answers will hurt other parts of our business. So. Uh, if, if we look at the various strategies out there, um, you know, one strategy is make things recyclable. You know, we, we do that. And uh, frankly, if a company designs into recyclability, which is the answer, our business and TerraCycle becomes irrelevant. And we've had examples of that where we've had to wind down certain programs, which we felt really good about, even though we lost the revenue, because uh, the company has designed their package into municipal recyclability. Then there's also the idea of uh, eliminating packaging altogether. And that is a wonderful uh, solution, and we applaud any company uh, 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 who does it and, ex and executes it. There are another, if in the reuse area, that's on the more, say, disposable area. On the reuse area, um, the models that we have seen out there are things like refill stations, things like buying concentrate and diluting at home, buying bulk and then filling at home. Um, and after we've carefully reviewed all of those uh, with our big uh, CPG partner friends who have a lot of resources in this, we found that all of those um, struggle to gain uh, a critical mass and scale, and they struggle for one key reason. Consumers are addicted to convenience, and asking a consumer, even though it's a very small task, to take a concentrate window cleaner and dilute it at home is uh, a big, huge barrier, and many consumers uh, would just rather throw out a bottle and get a new one, which is why, with Loop specifically, we are focused to make the behavior feel akin to disposability as much as possible. We want it to feel as disposable as possible, but act reusable. So what I mean by that is we proudly tell you, you don't have to wash, you don't have to sort, you don't have to fill yourself. You know, it's, it's a completely disposable experience, but acting reusable. And the reason we do that is the consumer I want to motivate is actually not your hardcore environmental consumer. We're, those folks love it and will be motivated anyway. I want to motivate the person who doesn't believe in climate change and get them to use these sort of platforms. So is it good that you allow them to be lazy, quote unquote, because over time they'll get sensitized or might it be bad because you'll never get them to actually do something to do have a better oh. uh, environmental footprint? I would say this, I think behavior change, foundational behavior change uh, is exceptionally difficult. And if, and that's a big if, you are able to accomplish it, it's a long tail. It takes potentially generations. And uh, if you read, you know, where we are from an environmental point of view, we don't have generations. We maybe have a decade. Um, and so, you know, we here would say we accept consumers for being bad actors. I don't think consumers are good people. I think consumers are selfish, uh, don't <laughs> care, you know, are, are just horrible actors. Um, and so let's accept that, that and say that's how the pieces on the chessboard move. Let's not hope that the pawn moves in a different way. Let's accept that it moves in that way and play into it. And then later, if someone can reinvent the rules of chess, that would be wonderful. But today they won't, and let's play with the rules we have. Right, and I guess we also, as marketers and as business people, we also need to admit we love them for being consumers and being lazy because that's, what making, that's what's making profits, right? I mean, let's not forget about that part as well. 
Um, sure, sure. A Very final yeah. question here, which I should really have asked, um, and then we need to really move on, which is your personal mission in 2030. Um, how do we talk about TerraCycle, about Tom Zaki and his involvement, and where we are from a recycling and sustainability perspective? Yeah, I mean, my hope, you know, in uh, uh, 10 years from now is that we have, you know, as a society made foundational shifts in our relationship to capitalism and how we leverage, you know, the great tool of capitalism to be more benevolent and destructive. Um, you know, and then within that, you know, obviously, you know, I think TerraCycle will play a, a bigger and growing role. Um, but I really hope that we are, you know, able to celebrate a shift. You know, right now, I think if you look at the zeitgeist, we are going in a very negative direction. You know, it's like a world is ending type of uh, narrative that's out there. Rightly so. I mean, look, the Amazon is burning. You know, species are dying. You know, the ocean's flooded with garbage. You know, I could rattle off negative after negative and hardly a positive. I hope sincerely for my children that that is shifting to where we are seeing scale uh, solutions uh, moving in the right direction and also you know all the macro uh, pieces the politics the corporate motivations also shifting that way um, and my role and my goal is to help facilitate that as much as I humanly can right Right. There's one more question, but uh, I see, Alex, you want to intervene. Can we do this Alex. one more question, which was about how to get involved if you are you have a corporate volunteering program? Yeah, that, I just wanted to try to pose that question before we time out. Uh, Tom, are there any corporate volunteering programs that TerraCycle does in partnership with other corporations, which could give an opportunity to the employees of the corporations to contribute or give back to society? Absolutely. I mean, we are very much tied into uh, that type of approach. And here's what I would say just for the sake of time. Um, uh, uh, if you're interested in that aspect from a TerraCycle point of view, please go to TerraCycle.com and send us a note and we'll promptly get back to you. And if you're interested in a reusable loop point of view, please go to LoopStore.com and uh, do the same. And our team will chat with you depending on what you're interested in, where, what area of the world you're in. Uh, let's find something. And you can also find me on LinkedIn personally. And I uh, usually do check messages on about a weekly basis. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, JP. I'm gonna gonna grab the uh, the spotlight from you now. Sorry for that brief uh, response to that final question. There, I hope you can uh, can track down the answers you're looking for through Tom's links and suggestions. There. Thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us today, and in particular, thank you to Tom Saki for for joining us uh, and JP for giving us your time to interview Tom. I think it was a very fascinating conversation. Uh, we hope to have many more of these. And of course, as a reminder, in the next few weeks, this will be available uh, as an audio podcast that you can share with your colleagues. Uh, and then, of course, on September 26th, again, we'll be joined by Rita McGrath. So please look out the registration page uh, for that session. But until then, we thank you very much. Thank you to Tom. Thank you, JP. And we hope to see you at another Marketing and Communications Center chat very soon. This has been Influencers from the Conference Board.